One of the challenges for thinking about Neanderthals and this new information we've gotten about Neanderthal genetic variation and the portion of Neanderthal variation that exists with us today is what do we call this contribution from Neanderthals? If Neanderthals were simply a different population relationship to modern humans, we might call it simply gene flow. Gene flow, again, is the evolutionary force that describes the movement of genes between populations. So why wouldn't we call that? Well, if you're a paleoanthropologist who thinks that Neanderthals are a different species, that they are isolated for more than 100,000 years and became evolved to very specific environments and became a different species, not Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, but Homo neanderthalensis, then you wouldn't call it gene flow. We don't use gene flow when we're talking about the movement of genes between different species. But part of the fuzziness around the species definition is that we know that genes do move between species, even in complex organisms. And this is something that we don't call gene flow, but we call introgression, the movement of genetic material from one species to another. So one way of interpreting the Neanderthal genetic data is to think that there was introgression from modern humans moving into Neanderthal populations, because they weren't fully divergent. They were divergent enough for us to recognize them as different species, perhaps, but not so divergent that they weren't able to accommodate some degree of genetic variation. Now, if we think, though, about a small amount of genetic variation entering into a new species or a different species, if we think about what evolutionary forces are likely to act on that new variation, one of the things that comes up first is genetic drift. This is simply a new, rare variant within a population or within a species. We might expect, because it's so rare, simply, that by chance alone it's going to be eliminated. And indeed, we'd expect that to happen to a high degree with any new genetic variation coming in from Neanderthals. So their actual contribution may have been greater than it appears today because genetic drift would have probably operated by chance to eliminate a lot of it. One of the things that would have minimized this or prevented this from happening is if the variation coming in from Neanderthals was actively being selected for. The genetic variation that we retained from Neanderthals maybe was selectively advantageous. Maybe selection operated to help keep that variation within an expanding modern human population. In this case, it's not simply introgression, but adaptive introgression. Introgression of specific genetic elements that might have been advantageous for the expanding modern human populations that came to occupy areas previously occupied by Neanderthals. This observation, however, that we share some small amount of genetic ancestry with Neanderthals still raises interesting questions for how we think about it. Even if that variation that we have from Neanderthals is very slight, it still might be very significant especially if it was adaptively introgressed into living human populations today. Now, if it's significant, surely that's an important part of our story. So how we interpret this Neanderthal ancestry, and that from other archaic populations such as the Denisovans, depends on how we understand that process. Was it simply gene flow between two distinct populations, one of which is now extinct? Was it introgression from one species to another? And if it was introgression, was it adaptive introgression? Was it an introgression that involved really specific and important elements that were selected for and are an important part of our evolutionary story as to how we became modern humans today? Now this question also is another one which requires us to know more. Right now we just have the first tantalizing clues of this story available to us. The first hints about the significant connection between living humans and those extinct ancestors in our past. But what we need to know is more about those populations in the past. What kind of similarities did they really share? What kind of interactions did they really have? How long was the interaction between these archaic populations and an expanding population of modern humans? And the genetic ancestry that we share, how important really was it for our evolutionary story? Were these elements that were selected for, that therefore were significant for how we became modern humans? All of these questions are ones which demand more research, but right now put the story of modern human origins into an era of understanding that has never existed in the past. We now have elements from not just archaeology and the fossil record, but from the genetic record that give us overlying and complementary pieces of evidence that allow us to test these questions and ask these questions in ways that have never been done before. So the future is probably going to look different than the past in terms of our understanding of Neanderthals and the role they played in our human evolutionary story. But for now, it's an open question as to whether or not we want to call them a different species or the same species, but it reflects our understanding of how evolutionary forces have acted to shape these observations available to us today.